I went downtown to get my grip. I come back home just to pull in the skip, just to pull in the skip. I went upstairs to make my bed. I made a mistake and I bumped my head just to pull in the skip, just to pull in the skip. I went downstairs to milk my cow. I made a mistake and I milked that cow just to pull in the skip, just to pull in the skip. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow never come. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow in the bone. And I'm hoo and I'm hoo and I'm hoo Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow's in the bone. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow never come. And I'm hoo and I'm hoo and I'm hoo I went downtown to get my grip. I come back home just to pull in the skip, just to pull in the skip. I went upstairs to make my bed. I made a mistake and I bumped my head just to pull in the skill, just to pull in the skill. I went downstairs to milk my cow. I made a mistake and I milked that cow just to pull in the skill, just to pull in the skill. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow never come. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow's in the bone. And I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today at the Penobscot Marine Museum. Please put your questions and comments below. We love hearing from you. Today, we are going to be talking about the Gulf of Mexico and the main built and main captained ships that sailed down to the Gulf of Mexico and the cargo that they carried. The song that we just heard was sung by young Ora Del Graham, recorded by John Lomax in 1940. That recording is in the Library of Congress, which has a wealth of recordings of Roots music in its collection, in addition to the maps and books that you think of. Some of those recordings are available online, and we'll put that link below at some point. The Gulf of Mexico has myriad dangers, both natural and human, and that was true in the 19th century as well as today. Here is the Cossack, a half brig which was built in East Machias, Maine in 1886. You can see the inscription here, which reads, Cossack, in the harbor of Galveston, after the hurricane on 19th and 20th of August, 1886. That was a category four hurricane, later known as the Indianola hurricane, and it wrought destruction along the Texas coast. Indianola was still attempting to recover from significant damage which had been caused by a previous hurricane about a decade earlier. During the 1886 storm, a huge swell of water, a storm surge, rose up and destroyed a large part of the town. And then a fire started, which destroyed what was left. Five weeks later, yet another storm tore through and the Indianola Post Office was permanently closed, marking the official end of Indianola as a town. The remains of the town now lie underwater. Galveston was able to recover from the hurricane and became the primary port of Texas in the 19th century. Let's look more closely at this painting of the cost. Two guys down here uh, discussing the situation. You can see smashed windows in the cabin. The mast has been snapped clean off and you can see the splintered pale wood here. When I was first looking at this painting, I thought this was just a rail. And then I looked and saw in the back, you can see the other side is all uh, the side of the ship boards uh, creating the side of the ship that on this side have been ripped off. You can see the pale parts of the wood where it's been broken off. 
somebody fishing, a common sight probably on every dock all over the world, across the centuries. A couple of schooners in the background. I find this painting very interesting. The vessel is painted so sharply in the bright Texas sun. It's such a contrast to what it must have looked like in the middle of a storm. And I wonder if it was kind of surreal for the crew after it was all over. The Cossack is not listed in the registry anymore after the storm, suggesting that it was never repaired and perhaps because it just suffered too much damage. I wonder if this poor guy here is trying to make that difficult decision whether or not to try to repair the damaged vessel. By 1900, Galveston was booming with a rapidly growing population and high average income. But another category four hurricane crashed through Galveston in 1900 with 140 mile winds. 10,000 people were left homeless and 8,000 people died in the Galveston area. It has been one of the deadliest hurricanes to date in the US. Houston became the main Texas port from then on. While researching Texas hurricanes, I came across a more lighthearted personal anecdote from Hurricane Carla, which hit Texas in 1967. Here's a passage from Robert C. Martin, manager of the radio station in Victoria, Texas. This is from the collection of Baylor University Institute for Oral History. When Hurricane Carla came through a big storm, it hit Victoria directly, Port Lavaca. And so we were, of course, covering it that as best we could. And Charlie, he called and said, I can take it a while out here if you people want to rest a while. And I said, that's a good idea, Charlie. So we threw the broadcast feed out to Charlie with his remote studio. And during that time, a little old lady called me. She was frightened to death at the height of the storm, roofs flying off, it was bad. She said, Mr. Martin, I think it would be a good if you all played a hymn. And I said, that's a good idea. And Charlie said, I'll take care of it. The song he played was, I'll Fly Away. That's the kind of character he was. He took serious things lightly and light things seriously. Other threats to the Gulf of Mexico include fishery habitat destruction. Mangrove trees grow all along the coast from Florida to Texas. Here's a photograph of birds roosting in a mangrove tree. And this is from Jack Stark of Florida, who was writing for the National Fisherman. These are the captions that go with the picture. He says, a mangrove tree is a haven for fish, crabs, shrimp, and birds, as this one illustrates, growing on an oyster bar off Marco Beach in the Gulf of Mexico. It is a black mangrove, while behind it are reds, which make up most of the coastline to produce a fish nursery. The mangrove is threatened by man, who is also now helping it to bring back quickly by replanting and seeding methods in this valuable commercial fishing area. Today, the Gulf of Mexico contains an 8,000 square mile hypoxic dead zone. Hypoxic meaning low or zero oxygen along the coast, starting in Louisiana and reaching Galveston, Texas. It is caused by high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus running off of farmland and down the Mississippi River. The nutrients feed huge algae blooms that then just consume all of the oxygen and 
that those dead zones are areas where fish and shrimp can't reproduce and even die. Here is the ship Wellfleet, a ship built in Boston in 1853. The ship is in a storm. Most of the sails are furled so as not to rip in high winds. You can see them all tied up here. The Well Fleet sailed from Boston to Liverpool and to New Orleans as a cotton packet. In 1864, Captain Henry S. Rich of Bucksport registered her in Hamburg, Germany to evade Confederate ship attacks. You can see the crew trying to take care of the ship while the waves are just crashing and flooding the decks. Thank you again so much for joining us today here at Penobscot Marine Museum. Please put your questions and comments below. This is the Nebraska, another cotton carrying packet ship. This one is painted by James E. Buttersworth. Packet ships were fast ships that sailed on a schedule with mail, passengers, and other time-sensitive cargo. You can see here as a, a regular little cabin in the front for the crew, like we've seen on most of these other paintings of ships. But in the back, in the aft of the ship, is just a huge cabin taking up the whole back half of the vessel. That's extra room for passengers. Many thousands of Haitian, German, and Irish immigrants arrived in New Orleans on packet ships like this in the 19th century. Nebraska's first trip was out to Liverpool and in 1847 sailed to Marseille. In 1850, they sailed to China. But for the most of the rest of the trips that this ship made, they were in the cotton trade. Large plantations in the South produced labor intensive cotton grown by enslaved African Americans. Cotton was then shipped out of New Orleans to large factories such as Lowell Mills in Massachusetts or Liverpool to go to mills in England. Young women worked in the spinning and weaving mills. Hours were long, the machines were deafening, the working conditions were dangerous. But these mill girls had a chance to earn a higher wage than any other offered to women at the time. They lived in boarding houses with other young women and were out on their own, even writing their own publications such as the Lowell Offering. Many girls and women left family farms for this new opportunity. In contrast, the African Americans in the cotton fields had no choice about working there. I will read you some pieces of Solomon Northup's description of working in the cotton fields in Louisiana. The women as frequently as the men perform this labor in all respects doing the field and stable work. During all these hoeings, the overseer or driver follows the slaves on horseback with a whip. If one falls behind or is a moment idle, he is whipped. In fact, the lash is flying from morning until night, the whole day long. The hoeing season thus continues from April until July, a field having no sooner been finished once than it is commenced again. In the latter part of August, the cotton picking season begins. Hands are required to be in the cotton field as soon as it is light in the morning. And with the exception of 10 or 15 minutes, 
which is given them at noon to swallow their allowance of cold bacon, they are not permitted to be a moment idle until it is too dark to see. And when the moon is full, they oftentimes labor till the middle of the night. The day's work over in the field, the baskets are carried to the gin house where the cotton is weighed. A slave never approaches the gin house with his basket of cotton, but with fear. If it falls short in weight, he knows that he must suffer. And if he has exceeded it by 10 or 20 pounds, in all probability, his master will measure the next day's task accordingly. So whether he has too little or too much, his approach to the gin house is always with fear and trembling. Most frequently they have too little and therefore it is that they are not anxious to leave the field. After weighing, follow the whippings. This done, the labor of the day is not yet ended by any means. Each one must then attend to his respective toward. One feeds the mules, another the swine, another cuts the wood and so forth. Besides, the packing is all done by candlelight. Finally, at a late hour, they reach the quarters, overcome with the day's toil. Then a fire must be kindled in the cabin, and the corn ground in a small hand mill, and supper and dinner for the next day in the field prepared. All that is allowed them is corn and bacon. Each one receives as weekly allowance three and a half pounds of bacon and corn enough to make a peck of meal. That is all. No tea, coffee, sugar. I reclined year after year on a plank 12 inches wide and 10 feet long. My pillow was a stick of wood. The bedding was a coarse blanket and not a rag or shred beside. The cabin is constructed of logs without floor or window. In stormy weather, the rain drives right through. An hour before daylight, the horn is blown. Then the slaves arise, prepare their breakfast, fill a gourd with water, in another deposit their dinner of cold bacon and corn cake and hurry to the field again. It is an offense invariably followed by flogging to be found at the quarters after daybreak. Then the fears and labors of another day begin, and until it's closed, there is no such thing as rest. He fears he will be caught lagging through the day. He fears to approach the gin house with his basket load of cotton at night. He fears when he lies down that he will oversleep himself in the morning. Such is a true, faithful, unexaggerated picture and description of the slave's daily life during the time of cotton picking on the shores of Bayou Boeuf. Just one last quick image for you. This is a photograph by Marty Bartlett. He is a photographer who has worked in the Gulf of Maine. And this image is Cabo San Lucas, the harbor entrance in Mexico. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you so much to our members and our donors. This programming has been brought to you in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor. Thank you and take care.